welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today in the show, we have Troy Burns. He's an internal medicine physician and he's the author of the book, Medical Answers Now How Direct Primary Care Guarantees Fast Access to Your Doctor. There's an excerpt from that book on Kevin MD titled Six Major Disadvantages of Insurance Involvement in Primary Care. Troy, welcome to the show. Kevin, thanks for having me. We'll get into your book and article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and journey to where you are today? Sure. Yeah, I, I, I guess I'm a little atypical as a physician in the sense that I have an entrepreneurial bent, which I've kind of exercised from the beginning. Uh, you know, I, I went to a six-year combined BAMD program and had my medical degree at uh, 24 years old and did a internal medicine internship and then uh, decided I needed to be creative and got out and started working in urgent care. And then very quickly, I, I hanging a shingle and starting a practice that was a specialty practice that took care of men with sexual dysfunction. So before it was called erectile dysfunction or ED, it was impotence in 1988 when I started doing this. And and as it turns out, I grew that thing to a national medical practice. We had 36 doctor's offices in 23 states, and it was a public company and, the, and you know, a pretty big deal. So that was uh, something they didn't teach me in medical school that I had to learn from a lot of people smarter than me. But uh, what I learned in all of that is that guys don't like to go to the doctor unless they they cut their finger off in the lawnmower or if their penis doesn't work, you know, then they, <laughs> then they go to the doctor and, uh, you know, you'd ask them, when's the last time you had a, a physical exam and they'd say World War II, you know, or <laughs> Vietnam or something. And so it was pretty obvious that men had a need for primary care, for preventive medicine. And so for me, my current medical practice that started in 2001 was a broadening of, of a men's health practice into primary care for men and preventive medicine for men. And then that has over the last eight years into this new delivery model of direct primary care. And as soon as I started doing that, all of my male patients were saying, well, this is great for me. You know, this is wonderful. I'm saving money. I have this wonderful access to my doctor. What about my wife and kids? And so we broadened into family practice and, and added a female family practice doctor. And now we're kind of expanding from there. So we're in Kansas City and uh, we were the first direct primary care practice in this town and one of the first probably 50 in the country to do this delivery model. So for some context, for those audience members who aren't familiar with the direct primary care model, what exactly is that? Yeah, direct primary care is insurance-free, membership-based, affordable, direct access, primary care relationship. So it's all of those things. Basically, what it isn't is concierge medicine. The traditional concierge model is, you know, pay me $20,000 a year and I'll come to your house. Well, people don't really need that, right? They don't need they don't need that kind of access, but they sure need a doctor when they need one or they end up accessing more expensive and uh, inefficient care. And so direct primary care is generally along the lines of less than $100 membership fee per month that gives people unrestricted access to their personal physician. So they can call, text, email, portal message, 24 seven, you know, within an hour, we're getting back to them at all hours and same day or next day appointments. And then other than that, it's primary care. It's just a much higher level of access for a retail, kind of a low retail price. So give us a sense of what your typical day is like. Yeah, I, when I transitioned from a very busy 25 or 30 patients a day primary care practice, which was insurance participating, over to direct primary care, my days shortened. So instead of working 11, 10 or 11 hour days, I, I was working patient care hours of less than seven probably. So I, I probably work a total, in addition to running the practice, I, I probably work 15 hours less uh, per week and I make a little more money than I was as a as a insurance based practitioner, and and so it's it's uh, much more flexible. And you know, in, in the past, when I'd go on vacation, 
it didn't just cost me the cost of my vacation. It cost me, you know, $25,000 of lost revenue in fee for service. And now membership fees come in and my partners take care of whatever needs to be taken care of. I don't feel quite as guilty about uh, taking a, taking a break. What's the effects of giving patients access to you kind of uh, more frequently than say in an insurance-based practice? In terms of your lifestyle, do patients text you all hours of the night? Do they call no. you off hours? So what's the, tell me about a little bit about that increased access and how that affects your life. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, the only reason it's possible to give them that increased access is because the patient panel is so limited. Mm -hmm. And so while the average, I mean, depending on who you talk to, the average uh, insurance-based primary care physician has a panel of 2,300, you know, members as an average, you know, some are, some are 1,500. And I've, I know physicians who have 4,000 mm -hmm. patients that they're responsible for. Well, most direct primary care physicians have have a third of that. I mean, they're between 400 and 800. You know, most of them are in the six or 600 range. I have 700 members. We call them members, they're patients, and that have been, and I've been kind of at my 700 number for three, three and a half years or mm -hmm. something like that. And because I only have 700, they don't bug me much. You know, mm -hmm. they, they know that they can access me whenever they need to. To. If they call me, it's usually something that I, you know, I'm not, I'm not delivering babies. And so that it, I don't have to go to the hospital. I mean, we have hospitalists that, you know, it's all outpatient. And so uh, I can, I send in prescriptions or I tell, or I tell them to meet me at the office in the morning or, or I tell them to go to the emergency room if that's needed. And, and uh, so it's really not very intrusive. And so I may on a, on a weekend, I might get a couple calls on Friday as soon as the office closes and I might not hear from any patients the rest of the weekend. And so being on call all the time really isn't uh, onerous at all. All right, let's talk about the excerpt on Kevin MD. It's titled Six Major Disadvantages of Insurance Involvement in Primary Care. Now, for those who didn't get a chance to read your article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the story of why you decided to share it? Yeah, I thought that that section of the, you know, the book, the book in general is is really describing the case for primary care in general and how there's value in having a primary care physician who knows you and who's accessible and you know the efficiencies that come in that and then you know and then kind of contrast the effect that insurance participation has on the relationship between doctors and patients and we're you know anyone any of your clinical you know audience already already knows that in practice in practical in the real world but you know the way i put it is health insurance is not the same as health care mm -hmm. right we really in a lot of ways we don't have a health care crisis in america we have a health insurance crisis and uh, so you know people if if anything health when it comes to primary care health insurance really makes things worse uh, in a lot of ways. And so, yeah, the estimates are that it's about 40 cents of every dollar that is paid for primary care services that goes into the relationship between the physician and the insurance company. And so, you know, the doctor's office has overhead to bill and collect and status claims and, you know, the float and all that. And then, of course, the insurance carrier, they have administrative costs to adjudicate claims and to pay and try to try to delay and keep mm -hmm. physicians from getting their money. And then, of course, they have a profit margin. So you peel all of that out and, it, and the cost of care drops by 40 percent. So that's that is dramatic. And so, so that is really the equation that allows me and direct primary care physicians to limit their panels, right? And then by limiting that panel to have an increased access. And so the kinds of things that get in the way, you know, these are, these are, I, I would call the insurance, the insurance participating process. There are a number of non-value added middlemen, mm -hmm. right? The insurance company, the insurance brokers, the you know the billing and collecting adjudicators, and all those kinds of things. They they don't add value. They just add time and mm -hmm. expense, and so they make it harder for us we we doctors to do our job, and 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 so they also are are doing that in a system that is volume based. 
right? The only way that we physicians get paid in that system is to turn the turnstile. And if our overhead goes up, well, you know, our reimbursement doesn't necessarily go up. So we have to turn more turnstiles. Mm -hmm. And so we have to do that from a, as a standpoint of more visits in a day that happen faster. Most physicians, whether they're employed or they're self self employed, have their own practice. They have some kind of benefit that is tied to their ordering practices. So they'll make some kind of a bonus if they're billing more labs and more tests and making more referrals to the hospital system that owns their practice. I mean, obviously there's some legal issues there, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, the volume of work, not just office visits, but but their ordering practices really determine their, their pay. And so that's a misaligned incentive. Right, and that's that's huge, and it should be huge for for patients to realize that they aren't aligned, you know, with their physicians, even if they're well-meaning. It, it's very difficult for physicians not to have that affect their decision making. So, you know, I, I encourage people in general to ask the question: Who pays your doctor? Mm -hmm. Who pays? Right? Who pay? That's who they work for. They work for who pays your who who pays them, and those misaligned incentives really mess things up. They, you know, it ends up that that the incentives are misaligned, and if a service isn't covered by insurance, a physician is less likely to order it, even if it's needed, and if it is covered they're more likely to order it even if it's not necessary, mm -hmm. right? So you've got overutilization of some things and underutilization maybe of important things that, that don't happen because of these misaligned incentives and the way the system is set up. And there's, you know, there's hidden costs that, that uh, people never know, right? They, they mm -hmm. sometimes are penalized by the way their insurance is set up and they pay more than the going kind of cash rates for services. If I'm ordering an MRI on somebody, their insurance copayment on an MRI almost always exceeds my negotiated cash price that I provide as a pass-through and don't make any money from local, you know, we've negotiated with local mm -hmm. imaging centers and they'll do an MRI of somebody's knee for $250. And if their copayment might be $800 or $1,000 on, on an MRI. So, so uh, you know, those kinds of hidden costs, you know, are really, are really an issue with uh, our system in general. So what are some of your answers to the problems that you just described? Can direct primary care be an answer to the, to the problems primary care faces? Yeah, I think that, again, the the value proposition of direct primary care is, is my patient pays me and I take care of them and then I'm their advocate and I'm their concierge in the sense that we're the personal shopper, right? Mm -hmm. We're the Sherpa that helps them navigate the system and not waste money on expensive drugs or expensive referrals or, you know, ER visits. You know, I, if I, if I sew up somebody's finger and keep them out of the emergency room, I might save them two years worth of membership fees in one, in one fell swoop. And so that's the, you know, the, the, the solution here is when it comes to things that are neither expensive nor unpredictable, which primary care is very predictable and it's and it is uh, and it's not expensive, then insurance putting putting those services under the umbrella of of insurance simply makes them more expensive and less efficient, and so just cutting out those middlemen. And it allows the physician to be available remarkably consistently to people who really need them when they need them. Now, most clinicians who transition to direct primary care, as you said, they have much smaller panel sizes. So that brings me to one of the criticisms I often hear about direct primary care is that we already have a primary care shortage. And if more clinicians are seeing fewer patients, how is that going to help your shortage? Yeah, good. That's an absolutely good question. Why is there a shortage, right? That's that's really the the point. Is you know why is there a shortage? The reason is that primary care physicians work really hard, as hard as any other doctor, and they get paid half as much. And so, especially since the cost of medical education has gone up so much, and people have hu humongous you know a debt that they have to pay back, it's not very attractive to go into a field that isn't reimbursed as well, and then know that you're going to be uh, 
seeing 30 patients a day just to, you know, just to pay your, pay your bills. Mm -hmm. And so my strong belief, and I've, I'm seeing this with not only, not only existing primary care physicians who are a little bit jealous of my lifestyle and my practice and are wishing they could get rid of insurance. I have a, a son who just graduated from medical school and there's a lot of discussion in medical schools in residencies about direct primary care. And so I think the cure to a primary care shortage is to make primary care more attractive from a lifestyle standpoint. And that's exactly what direct primary care does. We're talking to Troy Burns. He's an internal medicine physician, and he's the author of the book, Medical Answers Now, How Direct Primary Care Guarantees Fast Access to Your Doctor. There's an excerpt from that book on Kevin MD titled Six Major Disadvantages of Insurance Involvement in Primary Care. Troy, for those physicians who are interested in transitioning into a direct primary care practice, how can you do that? You know, it's a, it's a challenge in the sense that if they are employees, they probably have non-competes and things like that. And they have, most physicians really have no experience in running a business. And so, you know, it's, it, it's to, to, you have to have a lot of nerve or insanity to go hang a shingle and, and hope that uh, you can attract enough patients to pay, pay the bills. And so it, it, it is a cottage industry. So there aren't a lot of practices that are out employing physicians to do this. I guess my practice is a little bit unique in that we're expanding and we're adding physicians and locations and things in our area. And there are a handful of those around the country, but it's, if, if they're employed, then they're probably, if they're going to do something entrepreneurial like that, they're, they're probably going to be moonlighting, doing locums work or urgent care or something while they are building their patient panel within their DPC practice. And if they're one of the few remaining privately owned, you know, insurance-based primary care practices, then it takes some guts to uh, swallow hard and start firing your payers. Right. Which, uh, you know, mm -hmm. is something that we did and you just have to be able to predict what's going to, you know, what's going to happen. And we kind of released those insurance carriers one at a time, calculate what kinds of retention rates we were going to have. And, you know, you can kind of calculate that it's probably for most direct primary care practices that transitioned from an insurance-based practice, they have maybe 10% at most that stay with the practice because they're all conditioned to just, they can only go to a doctor that takes their insurance. And so, you know, we probably had 17 or 18% of our patients that stayed because we were already kind of a specialty practice for men at the time. I've had a few direct primary care physicians on the show and like yourself, a lot of them are successful. Now, are there cases where physicians aren't successful in making that transition to direct primary care because of the obstacles that you mentioned? I don't know. I don't know that many stories about that. I, I do, you know, I do know that sometimes uh, they are kind of huddling together, uh, comparing notes, trying to figure out how to operate a business. Cause you know, we physicians tend to be a little bit overconfident sometimes in our abilities. And just because we're technicians that have an entrepreneurial seizure as Gerber says in the e-myth, right? Mm -hmm. we have the seizure where all of a sudden, oh, we're, we're, we're business owners now and we don't know what we're doing. You know, it, they, they then scurry around and try to figure out how to operate a, a practice a little bit. And, and some of them, I, there's been a couple in Kansas city that have gone by the wayside, but, or have chosen to move on and do other things or to have a hybrid type practice. But it is, like I say, I mean, running a business, especially in these times recently with a tight job market and other things to get support in is not for the faint of heart. And my final question, what are some of your take home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? If they are all over the board in terms of their their medical backgrounds and things, it's just to recognize that direct primary care is really uh, growing like wildfire across the country. They're now, like I say, when I started doing direct primary care only eight years ago, there were about 50 practices and now there's about 15 or 1600 practices in every state and all across the country and all the major markets. So I'd say be on the lookout for these practices for yourself and for your friends and family and your patients because they, we are invariably providing 
superior access to personal physicians and care that because of that time that we have, triple the time per patient, that it really is better and faster and cheaper care. And of course, if primary care physicians are interested in getting into it, there's probably other direct primary care practices in their town that uh, they could meet with physicians and talk about it. Troy, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. And thanks again for being on your show. Thanks for having me, Kevin.